Okay. Everyone's ready. Please come to order for the special meeting of Glendale City Council. May we have roll call, please? Council members Devine? Here. Friedman? Here. Njarian? Here. Lieber? Here. Mayor Sinanian? Here. May we have the report, please? Agenda for the September 23rd, 2014 special public meeting of the City Council was posted on Thursday, September 18, 2014 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. What's next? Item before this body today is General Manager of Glendale Water and Power regarding purchase of solar generated electrical power. 1A is resolution dispensing with competitive bidding and authorizing a power purchase agreement with Skylar Resources LP for an amount not to exceed $731 million over the 25 year term. Thank you, Mr. Zern. Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, this is a uh, recommendation to the Council for us to enter into a long term power purchase agreement with Skylar for 50 megawatt hours of power, 50% of which will be renewable energy. This is a, a deal that is a uh, price stable, firm price uh, upon delivery. It's within our very, very sh narrowly defined transmission area. And I think most importantly, this project alone uh, will get us to our 2020 RPS requirement as mandated by the state. Uh, that 50% is guaranteed. It could be as much as 100%. Most of this will be a solar generated, but it could also be wind. It really doesn't matter to us as long as it's renewable, and it's guaranteed to be renewable during that period. We have a PowerPoint presentation for you if you, if you so desire, and we can have Mr. Peters from our power supply operation uh, come up and give that to you. Otherwise, if you'd rather, we can just answer questions. Staff is here. It's up to you. I don't need a... Re we were briefed. Well, Ms. Friedman? I have a... Uh, well, first, let's. I have questions, but let's. I don't have sure. a. I, I've seen the PowerPoint, so it's up to you all whether you want to. Uh, so, uh, let's have the PowerPoint. Absolutely. We've all seen the PowerPoint, but it's good for our. Uh, Mr. Peters, we'll if you will. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Lon Peters, Integrated Resources Planning Administrator. Uh, we have a presentation here uh, that reviews not only the proposed purchase, but also how it fits in the context of our portfolio and also of our mandates uh, regarding renewables. Uh, the first slide is simply a map that shows you the, uh, our, our portfolio of resources scattered around the West. The most important uh, uh, feature of this uh, map is the transmission bottlenecks that you see down in the left-hand corner, lower left-hand corner. The, um, this shows you the constraints that we face and the limitations that Mr. Zern referred to in terms of where we can go to actually buy power and get it delivered to the city. We have two bottlenecks, and we've got to work within those bottlenecks, or we face increased uh, cost just to acquire additional transmission capacity. Uh, this shows you uh, the long-term commitments that the city has made in the past, some of them going back, of course, to the 1930s, uh, decades long typically, depending on the resource. Uh, some are ownership uh, rights, some are contract rights. Um, one of them is expected to shut down in a few years, the San Juan coal plant, and we're negotiating a renewal of the Hoover contract that will take it out to 2067. The, uh, this is a, an, uh, some uh, summary information about our portfolio costs. This is the average cost per megawatt hour, fixed and variable. Uh, it shows from a low of Hoover, uh, Hoover of about $20 to a high of well over $100 at the local Grayson power plant. Uh, the proposed purchase that we have here today uh, would be in the just below $80 to start out with. It shows that there's a, quite a variety there and the overall portfolio is about $70. Mr. Peters, if I could take the opportunity, if you recall, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, in discussing a few weeks ago about the repowering effort that we were going through, I mentioned that the most expensive power in our portfolio is our own locally generated power, and you see that right there with the Grayson Power Plant. Uh, obviously, um, depending on how the IRP comes out, but a repowered Grayson would be significantly lower than that uh, when, we, when we put that into effect, if, in fact, that's the direction we go. Okay, this gives you uh, a picture of our total power supply budget. Uh, this includes everything we generate locally, everything we import, our transmission rights, o m at the Grayson Power Plant, and we've added the uh, capital program there at the top uh, that shows you 
uh, the expenditures over the next few years, mainly for uh, refurbishments at the power plant. Our, our annual budget is roughly $120 million a year uh, for context. Now, we have uh, mandates, uh, renewable uh, portfolio standard uh, in the state of California requires us to move up from our current level of 20 percent to 33 percent by 2020. We have, um, and I'll show you some graphs later, we have enough uh, grand what are called grandfathered renewables. Those are renewables that were already in place and generating electricity in 2010 to keep us in compliance this year and next year. But after that, our obligations do go up starting in 2016, and they step up rather uh, significantly till we get to 20, uh, 2020. And then, of course, after 2020, we don't know that the law might change. And we have some contracts that are some of the grandfather contracts that are actually going away after 2020. And we have to think about replacing those. So to put this into put some numbers around this, uh, when we move up from 20 to 25 percent, we need about 60,000 more megawatt hours or RECs uh, in 2016. When we get up to 2020, we're up to another 150 to 160,000 megawatt hours based on our current load forecast. And this proposed purchase would pretty much fill that gap, uh, leave us uh, uh, in compliance about 2020, and then we have to, of course, think about after 2020. Um, in addition to the renewable portfolio standard obligations, we have to think about our, the coal-fired plant, plants that are being either shut down or repowered. Uh, the current plan uh, that the um, State of New Mexico and the Environmental Protection Agency and various interveners put together for the San Juan coal-fired power plant requires our share of one unit, our, the unit that we're a uh, participant in, Unit 3, to be shut down at the end of 2017 to achieve the environmental compliance there for uh, Hayes standards. So we have to think about replacing that. And the Intermountain Power Project is currently planned for repowering. In about 2025, we may or may not have a share of that new power plant. If we don't, that's another uh, 35 to 40 megawatts of capacity we need to replace. On top of that, we have a carbon uh, cost that we have to think about. We have freely allocated allowances, about 600,000 per year through 2020. It goes down gradually. After 2020, we have no freely allocated allowances. We will then be on the market in the auctions or in the secondary market buying allowances to cover our carbon obligations. Um, the lower our carbon obligations are, the lower the cost of compliance will be. And again, moving toward renewables will help and non-coal replacement resources will help reduce that carbon cost. Um, we also, uh, another transaction we entered into recently with the same counterparty was a sale of 35 megawatts around the clock for 10 years to Schuyler Resources, delivered at Mead 230. This is important because it's a substation where we have ownership rights, transmission rights from that substation into Glendale. We save our freely allocated carbon allowances in 2014 through 2020 because the, uh, uh, the power will be delivered outside the state, and we can bank those carbon allowances that we don't use and save them for, for use after 2020 when we get no more freely allocated allowances. And, and Lon, just to, to reiterate, that's coal we're selling. That's coal power uh, that we are selling at the Nevada border. Uh, so now we have the offer from Schuyler. Um, having uh, sold them energy, um, they then said, well, we're also developing resources. And specifically, they're developing solar in Nevada, uh, and they're offering it to us at Mead 230, the same place where we deliver power to them. The amount is between 40 and 60 megawatts per hour. It, uh, they'll tell us the day before how much it will be, and it will be flat across that given day. Um, it's six days a week, um, and it's firm on the hours. So even though it's solar power, it's also combined with gas-fired power to make sure that when they say we're going to get 50, we get 50 every, every minute of the hour and every hour of that 16 hours of that given day. So whenever the uh, a cloud goes over the solar facility, the gas-fired plant will pick up and make sure that it fills the gap so that we continue to get the 50 megawatts or 55 or whatever that particular number is for that hour. Uh, they're, they're developing multiple solar sites in the same uh, service territory as the customer to which they're delivering. 
the energy that we're selling them. We don't have the single unit contingency risk. That is, if one power plant, one solar power facility fails for some reason, an inverter fails, or uh, a number of panels fails, there are a number of other sites that they're developing to make sure we continue to get the solar power that we've uh, contracted for. And some of the other projects that we looked at through SCAPA have had what we call the single project development risk. If the project doesn't get built, we don't get the energy. So here we're diversifying the solar portfolio. A um, little bit about Skylar Resources. They are a renewables development branch of an energy corp company uh, in Houston. Uh, they have various uh, renewable projects uh, scattered around the United States as well as in the uh, Virgin Islands. Uh, this is a map of the uh, service territory of Valley Electric Association in southwestern Nevada where the uh, Schuyler's uh, acquiring land rights, uh, making sure that the transmission lines are in place within the service territory of Valley so that they can get down to Mead, oops, the Mead where they're going to deliver to us is in the far south uh, east corner of this map. So the solar and the gas would all be developed outside California. Um, as I mentioned, this will be delivered where we already have transmission rights. Uh, the delivery is firm and also an important feature of this particular uh, transaction is that the es a fixed escalator on the price. We have a known fixed price the first year, a known escalator that's fixed by contract for 25 years. So we know exactly what it's gonna cost for the entire 25 years of the delivery of energy. And other alternatives that we've considered have some kind of uncertainty. We don't know whether we get, we'll get the transmission rights, what the transmission rights will cost if we can get them, what, whether we can get integration services, the firming services that we referred to earlier, and what that would cost and how that might change over time. And Schuyler is, is the Schuyler offer locks in those prices for us for the entire term. So this should help with rate stability in the future, budgeting and uh, cost control. Now, we've looked at a lot of alternatives over the last few years. Um, right here you have uh, seven lined up. The top three are wind options that we had uh, negotiated with Los Angeles, where we could call the wind back from LA in 2013 and 2014. We decided to turn those down, as you can see, because the budgeted cost, using the historical budgeted cost and making a forecast out into the future showed that those were going to be fairly expensive, starting out well over $100. Uh, we also looked at three different solar projects through SCAPA. We got involved in those negotiations, eventually withdrew from the negotiations. But again, by the time we got that delivered, and this is important, these are all comparable. This is apples to apples. This is energy delivered at airway for the residents of the city. Those were also gonna start out over $100 delivered and go up over time. Skyler is the, is the line on the bottom that shows that, that it shows that it starts out a little under $80 and goes up at uh, almost 2% per year. So that even by the time we're at the end of the contract, we should be spending a lot less money or no more money than we would have on any of the other projects. And we'll save all that money in the meantime. Uh, this is uh, an important, there's a lot of information in this graph. This shows um, one measure of our load resource balance. The, row on the, the line on the bottom is the known resources that we have some control over the costs of, either through, through a, a budgeting process or a long-term commitment of some kind. You can see that that line is stepping down over time. It steps down, the first step down is in 17, 2018 when the uh, San Juan plant is shut down. There's another big step down in 2027 when the IPP coal-fired plant is shut down or repowered. There are other reductions over time when other contracts that we have uh, expire. The line on the top is our obligation to serve. We have to deliver power inside the city. We also have to meet that 35 megawatt uh, commitment to Schuyler. The step down that you see in that top line is when the commitment to Schuyler goes away and at the end of 2023. The difference between the red line and the blue line is what we have to fill. We have to fill it with something. We can fill it with this project, we can fill it with uh, non-renewable energy, we have to fill it with something. Uh, part of it will be filled with natural gas that we will burn at Grayson and at Magnolia, but that's not a, 
uh, a known position, not a covered position. We have to go out and buy the gas. Some of it's already purchased for, for future delivery, but most of it's not. So part of the uh, benefit of this particular purchase is it creates the green line in between that shows it narrows the gap between the blue line and the red line. So this fills up part of the, uh, the, the short position that we need to fill just to cover our load, just to meet the, the loads in the city and the, and the sale to Schuyler. Uh, this graph shows how we uh, achieve um, compliance with RPS uh, with the purchase and without the purchase. The red line, uh, which grows from 150,000 megawatt hours and then flattens out, that shows our grandfathered resources. And, re and recognize, please, that there is a, there's a variability around these lines. They look precise, but they're not actually precise. The amount of energy that we get out of any one of these projects varies somewhat from year to year. So there's a distribution. It should be a kind of a fuzzy line. Uh, the, uh, the blue line shows our obligation stepping up over time. So you can see there's a big step up in 2016, and then it grows on a straight line until uh, 2020. And then the, the green line shows once, uh, if this, is, uh, if this uh, proposed purchase is approved, we would then be over complying a bit in 2016, 17, 18. We can bank those recs. We can use them for future compliance. So we're not buying something we cannot use. We buy it, we put it in the bank, we retire it later. It's a, it's a uh, certificate like with the coal or the carbon allowances. We keep them, we put them in the bank, and we use them in the future. Uh, the price that we've negotiated is $78.50 in the first year. There's an escalator. Uh, total cost, as we've mentioned, is about $730 over the 25-year life. Our power supply budget at today's rate is about $3 billion, is over $3 billion over that 25-year period. Of course, there will be increases in costs, so it will be in excess of $3 billion over that same 25-year period. That's our total supply, power supply budget. Um, so what else could we do? Well, we have to buy power to meet load. We have to buy it renewable power. We need to manage our carbon allowances. We could, we've looked at alternatives. If we went out today, or roughly today, and said we're just going to buy power for that same period of time, the same amount, delivered at the same point, it, uh, but not renewable, it would cost us roughly $675 million. What we're proposing here is $55 million more than that same non-renewable power would cost, same quantity, same delivery point, same period. And by 2031, based on current projections, this package of firmed solar power will be less expensive than non-renewable energy, based on today's prices. Uh, here's a comparison between what uh, Schuyler has proposed and, and some of the generic PPAs, purchase power agreements, that I've uh, worked on over the last couple, three years. And you can see that um, the green shows that Schuyler is, uh, has a benefit relative to the generic approach. Um, some of them are exactly the same, guaranteed minimum manual quantities, guaranteed minimum manual recs. But when we buy solar from a power project, Somewhere in the California desert or Nevada or Arizona, we don't have a firm delivery of energy to Glendale. We have intermittent output of a solar project, and we have to manage that. This proposal would give us that firm delivery, a reliable schedule. As you can see from the comparison with the alternatives, the price is competitive, and there's a management of long-term fuel price risk. That, that's all locked in. The gas needed to run the internal combustion engines to firm up the solar will be locked in. We don't have to worry about that either. Uh, I've talked about all of these, I think, up to this point. Uh, at the bottom, there's no, there are no bonds involved, no SCAPA overheads. Um, if the uh, supplier fails for some reason to deliver, then we stop paying. Uh, if they, uh, so that's our, that's our, our uh, insurance, if you will, and we don't have any bonded debt at that point. We don't have to go after assets. Um, and they've offered us an option to purchase the asset in the future if we want to. We have not worked out the details on that, and typically those details are 
not worked out in advance. Um, again, it's a, this is a summary of uh, the reasons we think it's a, a good idea. Uh, the current investment tax credit is, is scheduled to expire uh, at the end of 2016. That cuts about $20 off the price. That's why you see a price in the 70s instead of the 90s, which some of the others were. Um, again, it, it benefits us in many different ways. Um, this is the total quantity. Uh, again, the state restatement of the prices. And that's it. Yes, Ms. Friedman. I have a couple questions. Um, before I get to the questions, I have a comment. Um, uh, <coughs> something that you said caught my ear, uh, which was you mentioned the renewables and us exceeding what's required uh, in our portfolio, but not to worry because we're not purchasing something that we can't use because we can bank them. Right. So um, my comment before my questions is that I don't consider that to be something we can't use even if we can't bank them because using renewable energy and dealing with climate change and being on the forefront of that is a goal unto itself beyond our ability to Finance to financially gain um, from that uh, because, of course, it's been commodified. So now we can use those credits and we can offset them and we can trade them. Uh, but let's not forget that dealing with cli facing climate change and weaning ourselves off of dirty energy and off of coal should also be a goal beyond any financial goal that utility has. So that's my, my comment. First, is anyone from Schuyler here? No. It's interesting because this is a huge contract. Yeah, and, and I will tell you, Ms. Friedman, um, we have had a couple fits and starts on this, ready to bring it to you or not. Skylar's come down twice. Right. <laughs> we told them that we thought we, we okay. would be in a position where we wouldn't need them. They're, they're from back, they're from Houston. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they have not hesitated to come out and talk to us. Okay. They have not hesitated even without an invitation to come out and talk to us. Right. Uh, and okay. so. Got it. Um, the hydro in their portfolio, is that considered renewable? Is that Not count Hoover. Towards? Not Hoover. Not Hoover, but the rest. So because you One. mentioned hydro in their portfolio, is that Hoover or is that not Hoover? It's Tiatin. Hoover's in our portfolio, but it's not RPS. So their so the hydro. Tiet, the Tiatin, which is a Pacific Northwest project that we have ownership rights in, is RPS. Well, you, but no, you mentioned hydro in their portfolio. Oh, oh, Skyler has. And Skyler. So is that considered part of their renewable portfolio or not? It's not part of our renewable portfolio sure. because they're not selling us output from hydro units. Okay, they're not. Right. Okay. The they're just a hydro is, developer or I, they've I, brokered. I don't know exactly. But not all they're selling us is renewable, potentially. It's 50%. So is it possible that the, that 50% potential gap will be made up with hydro even though it's not? We would, it would not be considered renewable for us? Well, it could be considered renewable if it came from a small hydro facility that was RPS certified. So that's another potential source. And their obliga Schuyler's obligation to us is, is at least 50% of the total volume each year will come from what's called bucket one or portfolio content category one resources in California, which could be small hydro, solar, wind. Okay, no, I'm just, I'm just wondering because it says here that they, that in their resources, they have several hydro dams. So I'm just wondering whether that's part of, going to be part of our renewable it, portfolio their, or Their not. dams are in the Northeast. That we, we couldn't get the power to okay. us. We don't have the transmission capability. The that's the answer. Okay, thank you. Um, have we looked at the difference? I think that you had on one of your slides the difference financially between other alternatives besides Schuyler that would be 100% renewable. Did I read that slide correctly? Um, yes. Well, no, well, no, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It wasn't the, even that slide. There was another slide that was text, not a graph. Well, let me just ask the question. The question is, have we looked at an alternative to, to fill this power gap with any alternative that's more of a power broker like this that's 100% renewable? Or even asking Skylar, what, what would it cost us if you guaranteed us 100% renewable all the time instead Everything of Everything that we would do on the secondary market would be through a broker. Right. So have we asked Skylar what well, it would I'm, cost if, if they could provide us 100% renewable instead of guaranteeing 50%? I don't know that we would. I don't know that we don't, we don't need that to make our compliance with RPS. So, I understand that. But no. So no, we wouldn't ask that um, because it would be extremely expensive. 
I mean, you saw the difference between buying uh, power and buying RPS, RPS certified power um, to meet the, the uh, mandate. So you have to imagine if you extrapolate that further times two, it goes well beyond what we could ever afford. Because you had said that they're guaranteeing 50% renewable, but it could be up to 100%. So we don't know what they're going to be providing us. We just know that it's a minimum. We're buying a guarantee from them that it will be at least 50%. They will get us to that number. How they get there is on them. That's what we're buying um, from them, that assurance. So what is the difference between the 100% portfolio? And I, I understand I'm not suggesting that, but that's the goal at some point, whether it's 50 years or 100 years, at least now. I'm just... I, I defer it to be Lon, but double, I mean, it, it would be almost uh, if we were on to, the head of a pin mm -hmm. at, at this point trying to understand what the, the number could be. I mean, Which would effectively mean getting off gas completely. It would probably mean uh, a lot of storage, which uh, is fairly expensive right now, the cost of which I hope will come down over time as, as technology changes. Uh, a completely 100% uh, renewable portfolio wouldn't have any gas in it, um, or coal, or of course, or anything, any of the other fossil fuels. I don't know what it would cost. I think it's important for us at some point to have that number, because we do get correspondence from people all the time saying, why aren't we 100% renewable? Why are we doing this in steps? So if we truly can't afford it, it would be good to have those numbers. I know that it changes in energy prices change, but to have some ballpark to really explain what people's rates would be if we were to be 100 percent renewable uh, because the, the public asks mm -hmm. and we get those questions and i and that's why when the state of california went into this they did 2020 and they did they did it in steps so that the utilities had time to make that shift and the power could be the plants could be constructed because certainly when they went into this there weren't even probably enough power plants you know solar and wind to, to do all of right. that and do we know what the difference is between the natural gas um, and solar and wind approximately between those sorts of energies you mean the cost mm -hmm. today well if we went just with natural gas um, I mentioned that it would be the same volume uh, out over time delivered at the same place would be about $675 million. If it were just natural gas fired from the market power, that includes the carbon component. And we're proposing here a contract that would cost $730 million over the same period. So it's about, it's a little bit less than a 10% markup over the, what we colloquially call brown power. That is, it's, it's, uh, it's got some carbon content to it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about this graph here is that this shows the all-in delivered cost. So when, when, when you look at a line there or any point in time, and it, let's say it's um, $125, $95 of that might be the, the solar, and the other $30 is, is the non-renewable energy that's required to get it to to load in a firm manner in the city of Glendale. And that other $30 in that example is not renewable and it's probably gas fired and it doesn't qualify for renewable portfolio standards. Right. Um, so I forwarded to Mr. Zern and Mr. Ochoa a letter that we received from uh, Larry Morehouse. And um, since he did send it and it is in the public record, can you respond to his concerns publicly so that we do you want to do it? If you want to just go down his list and you can you don't have sure. to read it verbatim but just the general concern and what your response is mr. mayor members of the council there was uh, five questions that, that mr. Morehouse uh, posed in in his um, letter to you or his email to you regarding this particular project. Um, many of these are based on, uh, I, I think, just minimal knowledge. But in one, he talks about the recent contract that we awarded to Pace Global to do an integrated resource plan and, and why we wouldn't wait to do this project or to do this deal until the integrated resource plan is done. The answer to that is this kind of a deal, this is not included in the integrated resource plan. This is buying power to keep the lights on literally on a daily basis. So in the integrated resource plan, you're going to look at a lot of different things. In fact, you probably look at almost everything in our, in our operation except this. It will look at purchase power agreements in relation to local generation. So in other words, as it evaluates the repowering of Grayson, 
It'll look at the risks, the benefit risks, and the pros and the cons of do we repower Grayson and have some sort of a mixed portfolio of local generation and purchased, or do we mothball Grayson and go to just 100% purchased? It'll look at it from that perspective. It will not get into the weeds in a, in a, on a project of this detail. And if, if, you know, we can't wait six months to purchase power. If we don't do this deal, we're going to go tomorrow and start buying this power in another way, probably short term, probably more expensive. And Ron's marching orders for me will go find another solar project likely or another renewable project that we can get back to council quickly because we've got to make that RPS mandate. So they're really not related. Um, the second question was uh, the involvement of SCAPA. Uh, in regards to Schuyler's dealings with them, or was this a SCAPA project, or why wasn't this a SCAPA project? And Mr. Peters had shown you that list of, of love their long-term projects we have, most of which, all of which, are actually through SCAPA. And these are what I call brick-and-mortar projects. We own a portion of the project. We own everything. We own the debt service, the liability, the M&O, and the post-closure of that facility or, or decommissioning if, if so required. This is just a purchase agreement. We're just buying power from these folks. Um, SCAPA does not, as a joint action agency, does not generally um, do these kind of deals. These deals they leave up to the individual utilities. They do the bigger project deals where you develop the whole project from soup to nuts and they float the bonds and, and that's, that's their forte. On these particular purchase agreements like this, they leave that to the individual uh, utilities to, if they want to pursue that. Um, there was a question about, and I'm not going to read them word for word, but, but questioning Schuyler Resources as being a marketing sort of third party uh, in a firm that just puts deals together. That's exactly what they are. That's how we buy power. We buy them from brokers and third parties. Just as if you went out to the stock market and wanted to buy GM stock, you wouldn't go to GM, uh, to the CEO of GM to buy it or to their staff. You'd go to a stockbroker to buy their stock. That's how we buy power, through brokers. Um, so this is not an unusual situation. No, Schuyler won't own the power plant. They won't own the, uh, the solar fields, but they're putting all the parties together and doing the deal. I thought we did some of that trading in-house. We do, mm -hmm. but we do it with brokers. I mean, our traders deal with brokers. So we're, we're buying and selling power in-house to keep, to keep our electricity flowing, but the people we're buying it from are brokering. So we don't power. deal directly with the, the plants? Not always, no. In some cases we do, but in most cases we're dealing with brokers who, and firms who, who, who actually put these deals together. Um, and again, it just says Schuyler has no energy facilities. They are just a third party. You saw the list of projects they're involved in. Uh, I don't know that they physically own any particular project, but I, that, that doesn't mean that this isn't a good deal. Um, they've put it together and, and contractually we feel comfortable with it. And, and like I said, these are, these are kind of the deals not on this uh, long of a term that we've done in, in the past. Um, and then there was a, uh, a comment about it doesn't pass the smell test. I'm not quite sure what that means. But I mean, if the test is we're trying to find the least expensive way to meet our our energy needs to keep our rates down to meet our RPS standards, then I think it does pass the smell test. I think it absolutely passes the smell test. Now I've no, well, thank you. I know that we've invested in, um, we have invested in, in wind and solar uh, with SCAPA, I'm assuming. No solar. We, at this time, we have no solar in our portfolio. We have quite a bit of wind, though, yes. Are we looking to increase our um, ownership position in, in different renewables? No, not in any of the existing projects. We will continue to keep an open mind to see if ownership is, is right for us in a particular project versus something like a, a, a power purchase agreement like this, but we're going to leave all of our options open. It may very well be, and I'm not, I'm not dismissing ownership. We've done very well in, in, in our ownership of these projects. But when we have an opportunity to do, to do a project like this, and where we see that the past history shows that ownership, at least in solar, at least in the last two and a half years, has been significantly more ex expensive than this, we think for, for the timing, for now, for us, this is the right deal. So I'm assuming, though, that we are still looking at ways of increasing our renewables, that, that we're not just putting the economy of it at the to totally at the top. Absolutely. We continue to seek that out. I mean, the reality is 
and you know, when the, in the last electric rate adjustment, the council also approved certain adjustment charges that, that take into consideration regulatory charges and renewables and things like that. Um, but we also are always conscious of what the impact of the ratepayer is going to be. So first of all, we look at meeting the RPS standard, and then we're not stopping there. Uh, we, we're looking beyond that, but also trying to be very conscious of what that impact is going to be on the ratepayer. Um, I know that, that a lot of folks will say, you know, why aren't you 100 percent? But that's not knowing what the, the rate impact could be if we went to 100 percent. And, and, and we, we, will, we try to give you an RPS annual update. We'll include those kind of uh, discussions in, in future where, where we, we cost out that for a 90 percent portfolio, or 100 percent portfolio. So, but we continue to look at projects that we think are in the best interest of the city. My last question is uh, procedural. Did this go to GWP Commission? No. And so what is the, the, is the process not to vet these sorts of, of purchases through them? We haven't in the past, no. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I could just follow up on one earlier question. Um, in the uh, integrated resource plan that was approved by City Council in uh, August, uh, we'll be looking at portfolios that stress uh, environment, environmental compliance to a much higher standard than 33 percent. Okay, I'm looking forward to seeing that because, as I said before, I think that's very important. Uh, just a follow-up question. I'm quite sure you answered this already, but if the unlikely case that uh, Skylar were to have trouble and were to go under, like Enron, for example, we have no payment obligations to them, right? That's correct. Only Sorry. the energy. We only pay for what they deliver. And that, yeah. That we, are, we aren't prepaying anything on this. We don't prepay even a year or a month. We pay for what we receive. And if they did, we do have some legal recourse to go after them in the event that, that we didn't, they didn't meet their contractual obligations, uh, you know, as, as futile as that may be. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah. Ms. Devine? Uh, yeah. I know that you've worked long and hard. Uh, for this on this deal. I just want to make sure that I I understand this and our residents understand this that uh, this is guaranteeing uh, uh, the developing of firm power delivery of firm power right. correct uh, it, We need to buy it to make our load uh, to to remain um, compliant with the uh, RPS correct That's right uh, we only pay for what we get, which is what you just said. Nothing is prepaid, and there's no risk involved. Correct? <laughs> well, the ri if they, if they, I would, I guess I would go guaranteed, back to guaranteed. Yeah, right. Them. If they stop delivery, right. we won't get you the have, cheaper you power. Have recourse. That's that's we, right. what I mean. Yes, we lose exactly. that. We lose that power. That's okay. that's. Well, we, we don't pay for anything. We don't pay for it, but we'll lose it in relation to our portfolio, and we'll have to go find it somewhere else. And we'll, yeah. Okay. We'll and this it. also gives us the type of stability that we have yes. to have in terms of transmission through LA, right? That's that's. From what I understand, yes. we're relying on our existing transmission ownership and contract rights. But right. but the having having Skylar firm it for us exactly. is yes. is much much more beneficial, and that's in comparison to other agencies we've seen that have done these deals and not had the firming done by the by the generator, but by the city of Los Angeles. And it believe me, you, you're not going to get 25 years of guaranteed. You know, I, I think as Lon has has indicated, the best you get from LA is a year. A guarantee for a year, and then it's it's, and then you know you're in the project then, and so their firming costs could come back double. I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's probably not the case, but it come back higher, and you'll be you'll be then seeing this fluctuating uh, scale, which could impact your rates because you may have to come back, and if they raise it enough, that you'd have to go back and say we we may need to increase our rates. This at this firm price is fits into our existing COSA. And we don't see that, that, that need to go in and do any kind of special rate increase. This is, we don't even, we're not even asking for a budget uh, or an appropriation on this. This will fit into our existing budget. It'll just replace other power that we would have purchased, likely more expensive and likely not renewable. And this also makes uh, future COSA uh, easier to come up with. Absolutely. Right? It's more stable. Yep, absolutely. Yes, Mr. Andrew. So, I mean, just, just to recap, I know that... Uh, we had a lot of discussion on the future of the uh, utility, and one of the messages we heard from the residents was pay go. And this, at least as to this component, is the ultimate pay go, because we are not bonding. 
We are not putting at risk any of our assets if we were to, as an alternative, purchase part of a solar plant which could fail, which could not meet its business plan, which could cause unintended consequences further on. So this is a pay-go. Uh, it's a guaranteed price for the 25 years, which would see, which would create a stability in our rate structure, at least as to this part of it. We have many different uh, components to our le electric uh, purchasing. Uh, and it creates a commitment to meeting the renewable uh, stand, renewable resource uh, usage that uh, the RPS standards. That's all. So sure. I think it's, uh, personally, I think it's a very good work. Um, I had some questions. You answered them in our private session. Uh, and I think it's good for the residents of Glendale and it's good for the environment. And uh, I think it's a win-win for, for everyone concerned. Thank you. Last question. Uh, natural gas has become more abundant in the last five years than ever before. At, at least it seems so, especially natural gas that's being extracted in the United States. Yes. Um, Let's say in the unlikely scenario again that gas becomes much, much cheaper. It goes down by 50 percent, the value of gas. We're committed to this contract, right? There's no going back. I mean, we're Sorry. taking the risk that the price that's being offered to us is, is a good one. Right? That's, that's, that's correct. It, it locks in the price of the, of the renewal and the non-renewable. Yes. We, right. We still, we still maintain the RPS requirement, but on the other hand, we're also protected if gas goes the other way. And, and on, you know, uh, Mr. Mayor, we, we hear a lot of things that we're, we're gas self-sufficient. We may be oil self-sufficient. The next thing you know, a lot of that's based on fracking, and now fracking is not, not necessarily Most as popular. popular as it was. So that could greatly affect it. You're talking about delivery points for gas. We had expected to see gas prices come down a lot lower than they have. Um, and, you know, last winter was one thing where we got into a real steep winter in the, in the east, and gas supplies just went to heck. I mean, we were literally, there are days when we couldn't even buy gas, and if we could find it, we were paying whatever they wanted for it. Um, so we haven't really seen that abundance just yet. It could happen, but I think if there's a lot of dependence on fracking, that could be a whole different ballgame in the future. And, and if the price of natural gas went down, there's still that big gap there at the top that we have to fill. Sure. And if the price of natural gas went to $2, for example, instead of $4, we'd be buying $2 gas to help fill that gap. Okay, uh, so this, uh, this is a resolution. I'll move 1A. Okay, a second. Second. May we have the roll call, please? Council members Devine? Yes. Friedman? Yes. Jarian? Yes. Weaver? Aye. Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Next is adjournment. I'll move. We're adjourned at 4.31 p.m.